Mesdames, Messieurs, please all rise for the arrival of their Royal Highnesses, Crown Princess Victoria and Prince Daniel. Your Royal Highnesses, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, Dear Friends, It is with immense pleasure and a great honour that we welcome the Crown Princess Victoria and Prince Daniel to today's French-Swedish Business Forum. Organised together with the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce as part of the centenary celebrations of the Swedish Chamber of Commerce in France. We thank your Royal Highnesses for your continued support of French-Swedish friendship and the development of business and trade between our countries. I would also like to extend a special greeting to our Swedish ambassador to France, Veronica Mann Danielsson, and the French ambassador to Sweden, Jacques Lapouge, for your valuable presence here today. This year, represent an historic moment in the life of the Swedish Chamber of Commerce in France. It was precisely on the 14th of June, 1915, that its statutes were adopted, a board appointed, and the name Chambre de Commerce Suédoise en France decided. And having as its current objective to promote, to protect and develop commercial and industrial relations between France and Sweden. Today's conference, you will find, is perfectly in line with the aims and goals expressed 100 years ago and the goals we continue to strive for today. The aim of this conference is to focus on the future new cooperation possibilities between Swedish and French entrepreneurs, and startup growth potentials for innovative and creative companies. You will meet successful French tech companies and learn about the new French tech initiative, the French Ticket Program, and the booming French startup world. In the first quarter of 2015, a Paris venture capital firm was joint top investor in European technology startups with two German companies, according to the American research firm CB Insights. With the future always being closely linked to history, today's program will start by illustrating the exhilarating journey traveled by companies during more than 100 years and the impressive courage creative thinking and foresight developed at a time when distances were enormous and communications very difficult. And we will give also a special specific global historic perspective of the long-term close French-Swedish friendship and cooperation. So, wishing you all most welcome. I'm now pleased to leave the word to Maria Ranka CEO of the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce, who will be our much appreciated moderator today. Thank you. Thank you, Gita. Uh, bonjour à tous, bienvenue à Stockholm. Uh, it's a delight to see all of you here, and I'm really excited to this afternoon where we will learn more about the future as Gita said, but what is better when you're going to focus on the future to hear 
some learnings from history. And I'm very pleased to introduce today's first keynote speaker, Mr. Alexander Huseby, who is CEO of the Center for Business History. And the Center for Business History here in Stockholm is the world's largest business archive. Uh, and I would say that that is a, small, a sensational fact. So please welcome Alexander Huseby. Your Royal Highnesses, Excellencies, dear Chambers of Commerce in Sweden and France and honored guests. My name is Alexander Huseby and I'm the CEO uh, of the Center for Business History in Stockholm. We preserve and present business history on assignment both from individual companies and by the Swedish business sector as large. Today I have the pleasure to tell you an astounding story, both in facts and fiction, about Sweden's industrial development right around 1915, at the time when the Swedish Chamber of Commerce in France was founded. It is a story about a country where the idea of free trade gets full traction, where entrepreneurs take that chance to open border offers, where innovations line up and an atmosphere of openness to change rule. All import acts, important aspects of growth that I would like to believe Sweden has today as well. So let us open the story box and look back to that particular year, 1915. The old world is about to be buried by the Great War. What kind of Sweden is it that we meet? Well, to put a modern label on an historical economy, Sweden was a tiger economy. In 50 years, the BNP had grown with an average rate of 11%. We were in the midst of a transformational journey that other countries have done since and some are doing today in Asia and Africa. Sweden went from a being backwards agrarian country in the 1850s to a developed industrial nation by the first decades of the 1900s. We had companies at the cutting edge of the technologies of the time. A number of factors helped to shape this development. We had natural resources in abundance, smart engineers like Gustav Dahlén on this picture, who studied at home and abroad, and entrepreneurs who came from nowhere, turning their ideas into reality, and by example, showing that social mobility was more achievable than ever before. And Sweden had not the least forward-looking politicians who worked closely with business. Among these contributing factors, there is one event that stands out, and it is an event that actually got its inspiration from France. I'm talking about the almost revolutionary idea that took its former shape on a sunny afternoon on Saturday, 18th June, 1864, at the Royal Palace here in Stockholm. In the, uh, in the presence of His Majesty King Carl XV, this crucial piece of legislation that you see on this picture was formally adopted. What you see here is the legislation for expanded freedom of enterprise. It states that every Swedish man or woman can start and run their own companies within the Kingdom of Sweden. In Swedish, the language is official, almost solemn, and it accelerated the development of Swedish society in a way that is quite unique in the global economy of its time. Behind this reform was one of Sweden's greatest statesmen ever. You see him on this slide. May I present Minister of Finance Johan August Grifenstedt. He devoted his political career to modernizing Sweden, to turn the country into an international player to be reckoned with. He saw that Sweden could do so much more than just being a farming country and exporter of raw materials. In the government led by Louis de Jär, Gripenstedt pushed through many unprecedented reforms for promoting enterprising and entrepreneurship. He was often at odds with both the nobility and the peasant classes, but often enough had the backing of an understanding monarchy. Gripenstedt was a Francophile. His thinking, thinking was since early on inspired by Frédéric Bastiat, the French liberal politician and free trade prophet. 
Gripenstedt first came into close contact with Bastiat's writings during a grand voyage through France and to Paris. Bastiat, himself from a fa family of prominent winery businessmen, fought for free trade and free movement of goods and people, opposing mercantilism and meddling governments. The, this legacy from Bastiat and Gripenstedt is worth a thought. Now in our time, when our nations find themselves once again discussing freedom and all limitations on trade in the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, TTIP, the political discourse of today, both in Sweden and in France, reminds us all about the friction between regulation and free trade that was present already 150 years ago. Although right and left-wing politicians joined forces in opposing the free trade movement of Gripenstedt, it also had many proponents in Sweden. The media landscape was undergoing large transformations in the end of the 19th century. There you see another similarity of today. And books and newspapers were spread wider and faster than ever before. The new mass media gave room to important free trade voices such as Emilia Flygare Karlén and Wendela Hebbe, who were given space by publishers like Lars Johan Hjerta, the founder of the daily newspaper Aftonbladet. A forerunner he is, you could say, to Amazon founder Jeff Bezos of today. Now, for a small country that opens its borders for free trade, the opportunity is also there to allow yourself to be, shall we say, heavily influenced by others. Shameless information gathering and copying was part of the global economy, and Swedes copied like the best of them. For instance, delegations of Swedish scientists, engineers, and businessmen traveled in hordes to world exhibitions to gather both inspiration and information. However, in 1897, the Swedish delegation didn't have to travel far since the world came to them. The general art and industrial exposition of Stockholm was the highlight on our home turf. It also gave Swedish business and society a chance to show off Swedish companies and products. It is worth remembering that Stockholm in 1897 was the world's most telephone-connected city. And the exhibition was the first where you could even call to and from certain booths. Now, at another fair, eight years earlier, the famous Paris World Fair of 1889, Swedes had already played, let's call it, fundamental role, since the Eiffel Tower was kept together by bolts manufactured at Borgvik's Bruk in Värmland, the heart of Sweden. It's a rather odd trivia, but I would like to think it depended on Swedish quality and delivery precision. In fact, it seems that Swedish engineering towards the end of the 19th century was such an established concept in France that it made its way even into the popular fiction. Did you know that Jules Verne equipped Captain Nemo's submarine Nautilus with an engine from Swedish Motala Verkstad? in the novel 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, or Vin Milieu Sous from 1870. Now, Captain Nemo may have been a fictitious French entrepreneur who used Friedrich, Swedish innovations, but the very same Motala Verkstad also built 57 of the world's first oil tankers and delivered them to the Caspian Sea and to one of the more unknown companies where Swedish know-how in its time was at the forefront of technology. I'm talking about the family Nobel. Together with his brothers, Robert and Ludwig, Alfred Nobel owned the oil company Bra Nobel. Bra Nobel was based in St. Petersburg, the first large international market for Swedish enterprises. Exploration of oil in the Caspian Sea made the Bra Nobel company as large as the Rockefeller's Standard Oil. The Nobel conglomerate also had its French connection, since its financing partly came from Paris and the banking family of Rothschild. Alfred himself kept homes in many countries, as you know, and he established his own facilities in France already in 1871, both in and outside of Paris, where he also, as a young, ambitious man, had worked in the laboratory of Professor Peleus. Paris remained his main residence almost all the way until his death, and as we all know, his famous testament was written and signed in Paris at the Swedish club. But let us return to the tiger economy of Sweden. We have seen that the development from the freedom of enterprise legislation in 1864 to the year of 